Buenos días a todos. Good morning and welcome to this new event of the Spanish Energy Council. Honor to receive you in our building. Y sin más dilación, vamos a comenzar. Tenemos and now, with further ado, we will begin. We have a documentation where you can find connection to the internet so that you can connect to the internet and afterwards we will give you a password in Slido so that you can uh, present your presence. And now, Vice Chairman Pedro Miró, Vice Chairman Phipps will take the floor. Thank you, Honorable. Chairman Miguel Antoñanza, Chairman of the Spanish Energy Club, Chairman of uh, the Royal Institute in Cana, Espinoza, Secretary General of APEC, His Excellency Mohamed Sanor Parquinda. And friends, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to everyone and a warm welcome to CEPSA's headquarters for this year's event organized by the Spanish Committee of the World Energy Council titled Energy Futures, the Middle East and Regional Energy Transitions. The first part of the title, Energy Futures, is a repeat from last year's title, an ongoing and overriding theme for us, and most appropriately so, given that the future of energy concerns everyone, especially when we refer to topics such as energy transitions or energy geopolitics in regions that are vital for our industry and our country, such as the Middle East or North Africa. I'm especially proud to say that this is the second year in a row that CEPSA is hosting this very important event for the energy sector, which is truly gratifying for all of us who work here. Furthermore, it's a great honor to welcome OPEC Secretary General, His Excellency Mohamed Barkindo, the highest representative of the oil industry's most influential player since 1960, the OPEC. Mr. Barkindo's presence is, if I may say, uh, more relevant, uh, I'm sorry, more relevant considering the fact that we have not had in Madrid a visit of the Secretary General of the OPEC since 2008, when a visit of Mr. Lugman took place on the occasion of the World Petroleum Congress that was being held here in Madrid. We are truly privileged to have Mr. Barquindo here, considering that his appointment to the Office of Secretary General of OPEC in 2016 coincided with an unprecedented and historic turning point for the organization, namely the beginning of an enhanced and very constructive dialogue among oil industry stakeholders that started with the so-called Declaration of Cooperation among OPEC member countries and non-OPEC producers in December 2016. This declaration means that for the first time OPEC members, along with 11 non-OPEC producers, agreed to voluntarily adjust their all out output in a concerted effort to restore stability to the market. I'm sure that Mr. Barkindo can give us more insight into this milestone decision, its present status and outlook going forward. OPEC accounts for more than 40% of global oil production and continues to be a focal point of reference when it comes to geopolitics of oil markets. No one would argue that all of its decisions and agreements have a huge impact on all of us, which is why we follow them very closely on a day-to-day -day basis, giving the impact on our everyday lives. And this is why we are all eager to hear Mr. Vasquindo shares his thoughts and his analysis being with us today. The topics that will be addressed today, and particularly on the first round table, focus on three major geopolitical players that are key for the future of the Middle East and North Africa, Iran, Turkey, and Algeria. At the top of the list is Iran, a leading world oil producer, soon, soon to be subject to tough sanctions that will no doubt 
have a decisive impact on the oil markets. Then Turkey, a critical energy corridor for Europe and key for the Middle East geopolitics. And finally, Algeria, the largest gas producer in the Mediterranean area and a strategic supplier for Southern Europe, making it particularly important country, a country where additionally there is going to be presidential elections next year, which most probably could bring changes on the energy legislation of that country. The second central theme chosen for roundtable number two deals with energy transitions. And I mean transitions in plural, since although the commitment to move towards a new low emission energy system is embraced on a global level, the processes and mechanisms to implement this shift, as well as its pace, vary greatly depending on countries and regions. Governments, corporations, consumers, citizens. While we all want to achieve this common goal, we will need to adapt the manner of achieving it and its timing to the particular features and context of each country and region in order to make the most of the opportunities that are available. Because we need to remember that regional energy transition has a number of factors and components, not only climate related, but also others such as competitiveness, jobs, growth and progress that open up exciting new possibilities for all of us. Energy transitions can also have negative social and economic collateral effects, and we have to make every effort to alleviate them by ensuring a fair energy transition, meaning that we must seek an equitable balance and be responsive as much as we can to the needs of the most vulnerable person, regions, companies, and sectors of the society. The Spanish energy industry is fully committed to environmental and socioeconomic sustainability. We have made a valuable contribution to growth and prosperity, and we will continue to do so in the future, recognizing the fact that in countries such as Spain, industry carries considerable weight and represents a basic cornerstone of our economy, enabling us to more successfully weather any economic crisis that come along. This is why we wholeheartedly support the European Commission's objective to raise industry contribution to Europe's GDP up to the targeted 20% by 2020. I would like to end these opening remarks by extending my deepest gratitude to the Spanish Committee of the World Energy Council and to all its members, and acknowledge in particular the dedicated efforts of Inigo Díaz de Espada and Olaya del Rio as Chair and Secretary, respectively, of the Committee, who worked long and hard to put together this very relevant forum and to continue the excellent work that was previously done by Arturo Gonzalo and Marta Camacho from Repsol. I am also truly grateful to the Spanish Energy Club for being the place where we can all regard as our home and to the Alcano Royal Institute for their contributions and collaboration to this event. A special mention goes to the moderators, speakers and panelists joining us, especially those who have traveled a long way to share their thoughts and opinions with us. And last but not least, thanks to all of you for taking the time to be here today. One final message. We are at the juncture where all of us, as energy companies, share the same objectives and interests, and we are facing the same concerns, challenges, and opportunities. And this is clearly reflected in the activities of the Spanish Committee of the World Energy Council. In this respect, TEPSA, as a global energy company, is staunchly committed to the major goals of safety, security, and sustainability, and is firmly supportive of the work undertaken and instrumental role played by the Spanish Committee of the World Energy Council as a whole. Having said this, I will now hand over to Emilio Lamo de Spinoza, Chairman of the Cano Royal Institute. Thank you. Good morning. 
dear Pedro, dear Pedro Miró, Vice Chairman and CEO of TEPSA, and thank you to TEPSA for welcoming us today. Dear Miguel Antonio, Antonio as Chairman of Energy Group, whom I would like to congratulate for his recent appointment. It's a great honor, a great pleasure to have you here today. Muchas cosas han pasado en el mundo desde que hace un año tuve aquí. Muchas cosas han pasado desde que tuve la oportunidad de estar aquí un año antes, en la última edición de la TECME. Y especialmente desde que empecé a tomar parte en este programa hace muchos años, casi siete años, ha sido un periodo en el que no hay duda de que hemos visto cambios importantes en los cambios políticos y en la energía. Hay tres variables principales: la incertidumbre, por supuesto, que siempre están ahí. They are always there. We will always find them. Then technological innovations in, and I'm thinking first of all in the huge impact of fracking and the impact of climate change and energy transition finally. As we all know, 2015 for the first time the U.S. became in the first producer of oil in the world, 15 percent in total, thanks to their fracking, hydraulic fracking technologies. That is thanks to technology. And the price went from 100 to 30. The price has gone up later on, but mainly due to geopolitics. Uh, allow me also to highlight three main geopolitical dimensions that clearly structure the event of this year. First of all, there is a harmonized uh, action between the OPEC countries that has changed, changed the feeling of the sector. For instance, like the uh, play, uh, roles of Russia and Saudi Arabia. These are difficult actors from a, a geopolitical actor, and this affects the price of oil and also the global economy and its political balances. And it affects, of course, all of you in your everyday work, because the price of oil never changes as we would all like. Uh, Secretary General Barquindo knows very well how this happens and how difficult it is to see the outlook of the energy sector together with Russia in this OPEC Plus program. Second of all, during the last year, the micro region of North Africa and mid the Middle East has undergone what we have called at the Elgano Institute an acceleration of geopolitical changes. The new situation in Saudi Arabia, the blocking of Qatar, the Libyan state where there has been an assault to the national company in Tripoli, the tensions in Yemen, everyday tensions in Syria, Russians and Turkey's new attitudes, and finally uh, the new destabilizing factors like what has happened in Jerusalem, the new sanctions on Iran, the commercial crisis. As we see, the list never finishes. The first role, nevertheless, uh, given to the macro region has been has hit the target in three main countries, which I just, just mentioned. Iran, because of the uncertainties due to the sanctions that have already given results. Sec in second place, Turkey, which has a renewed uh, leadership after the presidential elections, but which is undergoing serious economic problems and a serious uh, authoritarian problem also that affects the NATO and also the EU. And finally, the expectatives for Spain in Argelia regarding the presidential elections next uh, spring and regarding the new announcements regarding the energy. Cristina Manzano is a member of our scientific council and I would like to thank her for her role as moderator. I know that this large list of uh, uncertainties does not include Venezuela and the jewel of the crown, Petróleos of Venezuela, and the new Mexican administration with Manuel López Obrador, which is also an important issue. And then, uh, during the last year, we have also followed the, the challenges of the climate change and the challenges in the energy sector after the United States abandoned the climate pact. Then COP21 is giving us a guidebook towards a sustainable low emissions uh, energy model. The rhythm uh, changes uh, clearly depending on the regions that are being analyzed. I would like to talk about the best examples also only. Some of them will be dealt with during the second panel of uh, today's event. First of all, China, which is the greatest emitter of CO2, but also one of the main leaders in energy transition. They are interested in renewables, in efficiency of energy, and also 
EVs. Second of all, India, which is one of the big emissions, the emissions per capita of which are comparable to uh, reducing the emissions to under 2% to degree centigrade, and they are really pledging on uh, solar energy. And in the U.S., there are many states, universities, and cities, and companies, and social organizations that have really pledged for tr energy transitions and for aligning with the Paris Agreement. Fourth of all, uh, there's the Lat Latin American sector, which have really high energetic ambitions there energy matrix is less fossil and they also have renewables and they have new experiences in mobility in Bogota, Santiago de Chile, Sao Paulo and we ha which have given really good results. And finally, as the Commissioner for Action in Energy, Miguel Arias Cañete, said after the agreements in 2019 in the EU regarding the objectives of energy efficiency, the EU is ready to raise its ambitions and continue being a model showing that it is able and willing to build a future low in CO2 emissions. And this will give an energy model which is based on renewables and on the fight against climate change, which we are all <coughs> interested in at the Instituto Elcano Royal Institute. So, uh, I would like to say finally that I'm very thankful to CEPSA and to Pedro Rimillo for welcoming us and for allowing the holding of this, of this event. And thanks to Miguel Antonianzas for his collaboration with our institute, not only in this new edition of TECME 2018, but also for his support to the work of our institute. And I would like to thank the team of TECME and its chairman. And to conclude, I would like to say that, as you know, our energy and climate change program works every day with all of you in order to carry out strict analysis. Our objective is to maximize our opportunities and to minimize risks in energy transitions and in climate challenges. And with your help, we believe that we will be able to improve our work in future years, which will be marked by an increasing geopolitical volatility, volatility and uh, by the fight against climate change. We will see this next year, and uh, I'm sure that we will talk about this once again. We cannot separate uh, geography from energy. As and as the wise men say, we are always there in the geography. Thank you. Muy buenos días, Your Excellency, Secretary General of OPEC, Mr. Bakindo, Chairman of Elcano Royal Institute, Vice Chairman and CEO of FEPSA. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome. As President of the Spanish Energy Club, it is a real pleasure for me to participate in the annual event of the Spanish Committee of the World Energy Council. I would like to start by thanking FEPSA and Pedro Miró in particular for having sponsored this event and for having hosted it as its wonderful headquarters and it's already the second year in a row. I would also like to thank El Cano Royal Institute and its chairman, Emilio Lamo de Espinosa, for being our strategic ally in this project, but also for having delivered already a very interesting uh, introductory speech. And of course, I would like to express my gratitude to all moderators, speakers and attendees for being here with us today. The annual event of the Spanish Committee, which has been held since 2004, has already become a very important gathering for the energy community in our country. This event serves to address different issues such as institutional relations, economics, geopolitics, and the social aspects of energy with a clear international dimension. This provides a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary vision that gives a differential component with the rest of our activities. I would therefore like to thank TECMES Chair Inigo Díaz de Espada. Thank you very much. Its Secretary General, Olaya del Rio, and all the member companies for their hard work to make this day possible. Our societies are experiencing a historic moment led by the three Ds, decarbonization, decentralization, and digitalization. In these new societies, citizens are called to play a central role. The energy transition cannot happen with the change of attitude by the consumers, by the people. 
This is going to be especially true in the most advanced economies. We are also witnessing important changes in the energy world that are modifying the global energy landscape. And these are the displacement of the center of gravity of the demand towards the emerging economies, the cost reductions derived from the technology developments, and the emergence of new business models created by this digitalization. Of course, these changes are happening at different levels and paces, depending on the region we analyze. Our future will be affected by all these mega trends, in which there are great uncertainties, but there are also big opportunities. All this happens within the framework of a very firm commitment of the entire international community towards a less emitting energy model. The goal is very clear since the Paris Agreement of 2015. The difficult part is knowing how to achieve it and at what pace and how to combine this commitment with universal access to energy for all. As you know, for the world population, this is a real challenge as expressed in the seventh objective of the SDGs and also how to do it in the most efficient and fair way for all. In Asia, countries such as China and India with different rhythms and motivations have started their own energy revolution with ambitious objectives in areas such as energy efficiency, renewables, or leading the, electronic, the electric vehicle penetration. The US, which has become the world's largest producer of hydrocarbons, has slowed down its climate action with the changing government. However, they have managed to reduce their emissions significantly in the last few years through the replacement of coal by gas. In addition, many of the states continue to bet heavily and lead the world in the development of renewables. Latin America has on the one hand some of the world's largest hydrocarbons producing countries. You have Brazil, Venezuela and others. But on the other hand, countries such as Chile and Mexico are also very relevant players in the deployment of low carbon technologies. When it comes to Europe, we have been leaders and drivers of this transition, convinced, based on our own experience, that it is possible to grow economically while emitting less CO2. On Sunday, at the same time that the OPEC was making some announcements and the projections, the European Union was also making balance of what was happening since 1990. And since 1990, the European economy has reduced by 23% its CO2 emissions. At the same time, the European economy has grown by 53%. So growth and climate action can actually go hand in hand. There's no risk of any economic downturn because of climate action. We are at a key moment as some of the Commission's latest proposals, winter package, mobility package, that are very relevant to our energy future are being debated within the European institutions. At the same time, the states are outlining their national plans, each of them based on their own characteristics. In Spain, we're working hard on the energy and climate plan together with the new law on climate change and energy transition. Both are expected to be ready later in this year and will certainly define the ambition of the country for the future. It will be very important to keep a close look on how energy transitions are evolving on the different regions. Only with responsibility and action from all agents, the objectives in this global commitment of humanity can be achieved. I therefore believe it has been very appropriate to choose energy transitions as the theme of one of the round tables for this year event. The whole world is following this direction, taking important steps in terms of sustainability. But fossil fuels, and we'll learn more today, continue to represent about 85% of global primary energy demand. For that reason, I think it is of great interest to have here today, for the traditional plenary session, one of the key players in the energy world the Secretary General of OPEC, an organization whose mission is to secure an efficient economic and regular supply of petroleum, concurrent with a steady income to the producers and providing a fair return to investors in the industry. In addition, the first panel of the day will focus on three countries in the Middle East and North Africa, chosen for their clear relevance in the oil and gas markets and for their importance to Europe. As you can see, there are many subjects for this new TECM event, so I do not want to take much more of your time. I should just like to observe, as every year, that members of the committee are going to participate in the event, giving their visions on these matters to the well-known, and you're all familiar with it, front row participations. The difference this year is that they will happen all at once in the final session. Conclusion, I would like to reiterate my gratitude to everyone, especially to His Excellency, Mr. Bankindo, 
Secretary General of OPEP, for having accepted our invitation to share with us your opinions about the future of oil and the role of the OPEC. Thank you very much.